It's an exciting time for us here at Supply Chain Insights. Today we're going to share what we've been doing on the Supply Chain Stoudemire. This is our sixth year of doing this analysis, and it's been quite exciting for us to see patterns of the supply chain public companies uh, as we look over the last six years. So welcome to our webinar. I would like to start with some housekeeping. This is Laura Ciceri. The webinar will be shared for everyone, so you know, no need for you to take notes. We share things widely. It'll be available on SlideShare. I'll also be posting some blog posts, and we will have a report that will come out in our newsletter at the end of the month. So as we think about supply chain excellence and we think about what drives supply chain excellence, give you a little background about supply chain insights. We're focused on trying to understand the patterns in the supply chain and we write for the business leader. So this is not going to be a discussion about IT. This is going to be about how do we drive business results. And we're going to start with some facts, right? You know, the question is, are supply chains working well? And we find that more companies today are raising their hands to say, it's not working as well as I'd like it to be. And we're trying to understand why. And there is a dichotomy in the industry because as companies raise their hands and they want to try new approaches, people push back and say, but don't we have best practices? And can't we just adopt these best practices? But really what we have are functional excellence and our focus in large companies on functional excellence, silos, procurement, manufacturing, distribution, transportation, throws the supply chain out of balance. And what you're gonna find is that 99% of companies are not able to drive improvement on a balanced scorecard of growth, operating margin, inventory returns, and return on invested capital. And one of the issues is that our organizational silos just aren't aligned, and most companies don't have a clear definition of supply chain excellence. So one of the things that I want to do today is to help you and your team to think hard about this, about how to drive alignment. Now, the supply chains to admire research is based upon the premise that companies that drive a balanced scorecard will do a better job of driving value. And we came up with this balanced scorecard through work with Arizona State University, where we looked at 65 different metrics in combination to say which metrics in combination would drive the highest value for market capitalization. That's the number of shares outstanding times the public value of the shares. And what we've tried to do is to look at which companies are able to drive this balanced scorecard. Now, there are many different variants of how people are looking at supply chain excellence today, and we're going to examine some of those and compare it to the supply chain Studemeyer analysis. But before we do, let's just start with an honest conversation. I wrote a book in 2012. This was the 30th anniversary of supply chain management. I've been an analyst and been working in the field for many, many years, and I believe that the 1.7% investment we had made in supply chain technologies as a percent of revenue had driven improvement at the intersection of inventory turns and operating margin. In fact, I had written many case studies where a company had taken a technology and a project team and driven results. But those happened to be project-based results and more short-term results and didn't necessarily translate to the balance sheet. And one of the things I found was I was wrong and I was facing, you know, what do I do about writing this book that was going to celebrate 30 years of supply chain excellence? In fact, today, the inventory levels are higher than pre-recessionary levels. And this is happening because of globalization, product complexity, channel proliferation, all good reasons, but we've not redesigned the supply chain to embrace the need for higher complexity. And so as a result, many companies have had swelling inventories and also have been really struggling with cost. And, you know, many companies focused on manufacturing, trying to drive the improvement in manufacturing to the bottom line. I have a lot of companies that have really focused on employee productivity and that hasn't translated to cost. So, you know, our ability to drive cost reduction out of manufacturing has also been stymied as some of the work on 
effective manufacturing that came out of the traditional world of OBE and uh, some of the traditional manufacturing concepts is also stalled. The long tails growing complexity, which is adding to demand volatility, and we now have skewed distributions as we're talking about optimization, so it's tougher. And we have unprecedented commodity pressures, and most people are not able to translate planning into price variance and commodity buying strategies very well. So these are some of our challenges. So when companies talk about supply chain excellence and they talk about these challenges, I ask them, what is the mission of the supply chain and how do you judge supply chain excellence? And if you look at Wikipedia, Wikipedia believes, and this is based upon collaborative writing, that the supply chain tries to minimize total cost. And in fact, many companies will try to minimize cost. And as they do that, they'll throw the supply chain out of balance because the supply chain is a complex nonlinear system. In a similar fashion, ASCM, which is the new name of the APEX organization, launched yesterday a belief statement that said the best supply chains are ethical, ecological, and economical. And neither of these definitions have anything about the supply chain driving growth. Now, I worked at Gartner, actually I worked at AMR, uh, when the AMR research definition uh, developed for what is now the Gartner Top 25. And my struggle was that the Gartner Top 25 puts all companies in a spreadsheet, shakes them up and compares companies like BASF to Intel without really looking at industry differences. And you'll see in this webinar, they're very stark industry differences. And also, it only looks at large companies, and the analysis is not necessarily looking at the same balance scorecard. The Gartner Top 25 doesn't look at the intersection of inventory turns and also operating margin or cost, and also doesn't look at a long view, looks at a shorter term view of where companies are actually moving. And it also includes corporate social responsibility, which I think is really an improvement of Gartner Top 25. But I struggle because these metrics are not the metrics that I see that translate to market cap or price to tangible book, a value analysis, and the fact that it's 50% opinion. So in the supply chains to admire work, we actually took 610 companies by 29 peer groups, and we looked at first are companies driving improvement? And we measure improvement by the supply chain index, which starts with the mapping of orbit charts and a study of patterns and does vector analysis on year-over-year -year analysis. And the supply chains to admire analysis is for the period of 2010 to 2018. Then we ask the question, if companies are driving improvement, are they also driving performance? So are they above the peer group at the mean, taking out the outliers, for growth, operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital. And then if companies pass those two tests, we test for value of our companies above the mean for price to tangible book or market capitalization, two measures of value. And because the balance scorecard is really correlated to value, Every company that I found that met the first two criteria actually met the third and both tangible book and market capitalization. So this is our sixth year of doing the analysis. These are the Gartner top 25 award winners. I do not find that any of the Gartner top 25 award winners actually meet the balance scorecard criteria that drive value based upon our analysis. We also have had prior supply chains to admire winners in the Gartner Top 25, L'Oreal, BASF, Cisco, Intel, Nike, and Coca-Cola, but not this year. This year, there's no overlap. This year, the supply chains to admire analysis does not overlap with the Gartner Top 25 at all, primarily because of the difference in how we calculate. So let's take a closer look. So Johnson & Johnson is on the Gartner Top 25. And if you take my criteria of 
driving improvement, you can see in the orbit chart, which this is an orbit chart, we start with 2010, we end with 2018, and each of the dots represents the intersection of these two values of inventory turns, which we want inventory turns to be high, and operating margin. So you can see it's not a straight line, and J&J &J is going backwards in margin, and you know not consistent improvement in inventory turns. So then you say, well, is J&J &J a pharmaceuticals company, a medical device company, a household products company? Well, yes, they're all three. And you've got to say, does this performance beat the industry average for J&J &J in these industry subgroups? And you can see that it does beat the pharmaceutical average, but not the medical device and not the household products average. And so we actually grouped J and J into pharmaceuticals, but J and J falls out of the supply chain to admire because of a lack of improvement. Now let's take BASF. BASF is also a Gartner Top 25 Award winner, was a prior supply chains to admire award winner, but has actually fallen out of this analysis because of the lack of improvement. You can see the slippage in margin and also the slippage in inventory turns against the chemical average of 7% margin and 5.2 turns. Okay, let's take Nike. Nike also falls out because of the extreme impact of margin on what we've seen in tax, tariff, labor arbitration, supply chain design pressures on apparel, and so Nike is actually above the average in margin, but uh, you know, has some issues with improvement. So why the supply chains to admire? Well, we wanted an objective measurement of supply chain excellence for our research. For those that follow the company, you know that we sit on about 10,000 quantitative responses, and we're trying to get an understanding of what drives balance sheet performance in supply chain. It's a complex study and one that, you know, is really taken us seven years. We continue to do the data and it's not an easy question and we needed an objective measurement and that's why we came up with the supply chain stiff Meyer index. We also wanted to share data to help supply chain leaders to benchmark because each industry is different and we wanted to show how fast it actually takes to improve supply chains. The discussion of improvement performance is a very, very interesting discussion that I'll talk a little bit more about. And we wanted to help supply chain leaders to talk the language of finance and finance teams to understand what is possible in supply chain because the supply chain is a complex nonlinear system that many financial executives don't understand, and we wanted to build an objective that is data-driven, something that was devoid of opinion, and we would have liked to have had things like customer service in the analysis, but there is no good industry standard of customer service. Likewise, I think that, you know, there are questions about corporate social responsibility and the lack of a good standard. So we wanted something that was data-driven, so we're actually working off the balance sheet analysis. Doesn't mean that Corporate social responsibility is not important. Doesn't mean that customer service is not important. It's just that I don't think I have a good metric for that. So what defines supply chain excellence, right? It's resilience, the ability to drive consistent results year over year and weather the market factors, the ability to have balance on the scorecard, the ability to outperform the industry peer group to drive improvement because like you saw, in, BASF and Nike and J&J, &J, they're losing ground against the peer group and the ability to deliver value, to shift from a cost-based focus to really be able to deliver value. So let's take an industry like food, right? If you look at this food orbit chart, you can see that it's been a tough period, 2010 to 2018 for food, slipping on both margin and struggling on inventory turns. And let's take an example of resiliency, right? So if we take Smuckers versus Kraft, both have gone through intense pressures with mergers and acquisitions. And you can see that Smuckers is far more resilient year-over-year -year improvement versus Kraft 
even though Kraft is operating at a higher average. Kraft has a 19% margin and 6.38 inventory turns, where Smucker's has a 16% margin and 4.27 turns against the industry standard that is in the green box. So you gotta say, would you rather be Kraft, Heinz, or would you rather be Smucker's? I'd rather be Smucker's because it's much more predictable. The wild springs and swings of Kraft Heinz, which lack resilience, this is an example of resiliency, are problematic. Now, when we talk about performance versus improvement, right? Which guy in the gym do you think drives improvement faster? Well, of course, it's gonna be the guy on the right. So the improvement metric will favor the company that has the most to improve. The guy who's been working hard, you know, and, you know, has really driven high performance, incremental improvement is hard. And so we find in many industries like household products that the industry has made progress, but there is no individual company that has driven improvement to the degree against some of the market factors to qualify for the supply chains to admire. This balance of performance and improvement is an interesting one because you've really got to look at both together. Are the companies outperforming the peer group and are they driving improvement faster than the peer group? Now, a lot of times people make a lot of mistakes in this kind of work on supply chain excellence. They measure too many things, they focus on functional performance like manufacturing cost or transportation versus margin or something that goes across the organization or short term. We find that it takes three to four years to actually drive improvement. We're just now seeing that improvement in Schneider Electric and Ecolabs from you know, a visionary leader. Lack of awareness of industry performance, the ability to really know where the company is against the industry and confusion between financial re-engineering and the delivery of value. There are lots of tactics that supply chain leaders have engaged in, like tax efficient supply chains or chasing the lower cost of labor or elongation of payables to be able to artificially manipulate working capital. But what happens is those do not translate to value. They do not give us resilience and long-term value in the supply chain. The companies that are driving value, are driving innovation that's based upon customer-centric understanding of innovation, and they're balanced. So let's get to the winners. Now, we're not all the way done. This will actually be summarized in a report. I'm still working on a few data elements, so this may change slightly. These are clear winners, but I may have some additional ones in the final report. The analysis is based upon these industry subsegments, 655 companies. We really look at each industry by itself. Let's look at apparel retail, right? So if we look at apparel retail, this was the industry factor. I mean, we'll look at the shift in margin and uh, the Amazon effect here. Ross Stores is the winner in this particular category. No nonsense, no frills retailer, regional supply chain, very focused on the customer, really looking at sourcing and how do we get the right goods to the store. Urban Outfitters falls out of this. Uh, Urban Outfitters has been redefining their data model, their clothes, but not quite a winner. And I actually met with Urban Outfitters last week and you know, they're doing some very interesting work on returns of apparel and I think they'll come back, but that's where we're at. Steve Madden is also an example of a close uh, competitor, but doesn't quite make it to the winner's circle. Let's look at grocery retail. In grocery retail, again, you know, tough environment. I mean, look at these swings and operating margin and inventory turns for grocery retail. Ugly, ugly, and awful actually is the winner here outperforming the industry. And again, you've got to look at the patterns of the company compared to the patterns of the industry to be able to determine the winners. So Ahold is actually punched back in terms of margin uh, with some of their innovative uh, you know, formats into grocery retail. And we find in retail that it is the format and the alignment of the format with the customer that makes a difference. Let's look at beverages. 
you know, again, tough market in the beverage industry. Look at that change in inventory turns and the lack of margin as we've proliferated. And, you know, we have spirits competing with carbonated beverages for the throat. Monster is the winner here. Very innovative company, new brand. We find that it's easier for a company that's very focused on innovation, very focused on the customer in a new market to build the value. And I think it becomes that these companies are much more aligned on the customer. They're smaller, they're clearer on what their mission is, and it's easier for them to drive the balance sheet. And here we have Boston Beer versus Monster Beverages. Boston Beer is the closest competitor to Monster. You can see that Boston Beer is going back slightly, but this is a good way for you to use orbit chart analysis to be able to compare two peer groups. Containers and packaging. You know, if we look at containers and packaging, they had a lot of room for improvement and they are driving and they're driving in the margin and they have greatly matured their supply chain processes. PCA rises to the top here in terms of being able to drive improvement and resiliency. Some of this industry is really <laughs> all over the map in the orbit charts, which, you know, as you look at supplier sourcing, a supplier that is not very resilient should be a risk alarm for you on the orbit charts. So congratulations to PCA. Let's look at chemicals. You know, chemical industry for a couple of years has had no winners. And so it gives me great delight as I look at this chart. You know, again, the chemical industry struggled, you know, for inventory turns as more companies pushed cost and waste back in the supply chain, penalizing the chemical companies for inventory. And chemical companies became more global, have more in-transit in inventories. So it's been a tough period for chemical companies. But last year, I didn't have a chemical company in the supply chain, Stubmeyer. This year I have two. Eastman Chemical comes back to the winner circle. Eastman Chemical was a winner uh, five years ago. Uh, they're coming back to the circle and you can see that uh, they're beating the margin and uh, inventory turns. And Ecolab, which is a success story for leadership, uh, comes to the winner circle. Ecolab has been really very close to getting into the winner circle for many years. So it gives me great pleasure to see the Ecolab group make the winner circle. Let's look at pharmaceuticals. Again, the pharmaceutical industry uh, drove tremendous improvement in margin post-recession, um, not very resilient supply chains. Uh, the lack of resiliency in the pharmaceutical supply chain is very stark compared to the rest of the industry. But I do have a pharmaceutical winner for the first time that I've been studying uh, the supply chain stuff, Meyer, and it's Abvi. Abvi is a spinoff of Abbott, very focused on biologics, and congratulations to Abvi for winning the supply chain Stuttmeyer. And we will be posting all these charts. I know that, you know, this is probably overwhelming, but uh, we will be posting all this data. Medical device. Uh, again, if we look at medical device, medical device has improved margin. Uh, this is not an industry that started out to be really strong in supply chain processes, but has evolved the supply chain processes. And the winner in medical device is Intuitive Surgical, which is a robotics company for helping the surgeon to improve outcomes through robotics. So again, in pharmaceutical, and in medical device and in beverages, it's a small innovative company really focused on innovation and a clear compelling reason to be that's driving higher value. Trucks and heavy equipment, uh, again, you know, tough market, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, the ups and downs post recession, but the clear winner in this market is Packer. The close competitor is Cummins, but Cummins has been a winner prior years, but falls out of the winner circle this year. Uh, Packer has driven greater levels of improvement performance in this particular industry. So from this, there's a couple of things I want you to take away. Tough markets, right? There is no industry that I've shown you and I've posted on SlideShare 
all of the industry trends of what these companies are facing, which is all the more reason why we should be outside in in our management of supply chain, not inside out, right? When we're focused on orders and shipments and functional alignment, we're not able to balance the company through the economic factors, through the competitive factors and the market changes. The companies that focus on performance improvement over many years with leadership and a clear focus on balance sheets do the best. Those that are also driving innovation with a clear mission also do well in this analysis. So, you know, if you said, you know, what are the top performing supply chains? I doubt if anybody on this call would have listed the supply chains I just talked about, right? You know, as we go to conference after conference or we read case study after case study, you know, we're not really talking about balance sheet performance year over year. And we're not talking about how that company punched back in an industry that was really struggling to drive performance. And 62% of the supply chains drive performance in single metrics, like Nova Nordisk is very close to being a pharmaceutical winner and has been for the last six years, but Nova Nordisk drives improvement in cost, and you see that in operating margin, but is underperforming in inventory turns. Likewise, Procter & Gamble has made tremendous improvement pushing back through all the mergers and acquisitions and rationalization of all the items, but underperforms return on invested capital versus a company on the peer group. So, you know, single metrics focus is a problem for a lot of companies. Clear mission, a lot of times because of the lack of alignment, particularly in global companies, Companies aren't clear in the mission, aren't clear on what really matters to customers. Those companies that are very innovative, Monster, Sam Adams, focused on innovative business models, robotics and surgical, and they're outside in, they're focused on the market, they tend to do better. The companies that are very focused on cost throw themselves out of balance and we just can't save our way to value, right? It really requires working on the balance scorecard. And I hope you see from these industry charts that we should question the status quo. The traditional way of optimization, the focus within the four walls, the focus on transactional systems are not getting us where we need to go. Instead, what we've got to really do is build networks and go outside in and adopt deeper levels of optimization. And it becomes even more critical with the evolution of the autonomous supply chain, because if we aren't in the center of telling bots and cognitive computing what excellence looks like, we can go off the cliff pretty quickly. So as you sit back and I'm going to share these slides tonight on SlideShare and do some write-ups on my blog so that you can see all the details. I want you to think about applying the concepts. The first thing for you is to define supply chain excellence. I'm not saying that you necessarily have to adopt the supply chain stone Meyer methodology or the Gartner Top 25. You've got to adopt something that works for you. And there has to be a clear reason why. And the way I say to people, you know, let's get started is take your last year, look at where the organization failed. Maybe it's a new product launch, maybe it was a channel, maybe it was a supplier resiliency issue. And look at all those oops moments from the last year and sit back and think about what drove that. Was it metrics? Was it technology? Was it process? And then build your orbit charts. Plot operating margin and inventory turns, study your patterns. Plot growth and return on invested capital, study your patterns. Plot your patterns against peer group. And then ask yourself, are you driving improvement and are you outperforming your peer group? And that peer group analysis is not easy because different companies will group companies differently based upon their strategy. 
and then build your scorecard with cross-functional targets and use this in sales and operations planning and network design and get very clear on the connection of that to strategy. Ask yourself the hard question, what drives value? Understand what drives value for the customer, what drives value for the shareholders, and build that into supply chain strategy. This is the balance scorecard that we use in the supply chains to admire really rewarding companies that focus on year-over-year -year growth, operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital. This may not be the balance scorecard for you, but if you reward functional metrics, you will throw the supply chain out of balance and not drive value. And the way to do this is to build your scorecard for the organization and hold the organization accountable on bonus incentives for the scorecard and focus the functions on reliability, focus planning on forecast value add and manufacturing on first pass yield. Do not reward functions for things like lowest manufacturing costs or lowest transportation costs or sales volume. Instead, you've really got to align the organization at a top level on the scorecard and at the bottom level on reliability. And when it comes to inventory, get past safety stock to really focus on form and function of inventory. So I started with, let's have a hard discussion. We've not made improvement in a lot of the blocking and tackling we need to have in supply chain. Increased complexity, growing inventories, growing commodity pressures. We can no longer drive the improvement in supply chain from manufacturing assets that we used to be able to do. I talked about the industry complexity, showed you industry charts that show just how tough it is for the supply chain to drive improvement. And I also am challenging the paradigm that it's the traditional companies that are driving the most improvement and are the places that we can learn the most from. Instead, it's the companies that are challenging the status quo with innovative business models with a drive on innovation that drives breakthrough performance for the customer. So as you think about you know, your performance. I'm hoping that you can learn from the supply chains to admire. We will be asking some companies from the supply chains to admire analysis to speak at our Imagine conference, which will be happening in September in Chicago, where we'll be focusing on innovation and new ways of working. I'm hoping to see you all there and to register. And let me see if I have any questions. If anybody has any questions, just put them into our poll and uh, let me know. But we continue to triangulate on the supply chains to admire analysis around choices in technology, choices in consultants. And the only correlations we've been able to find so far are satisfied employees. So companies that tend to have higher satisfaction of employees tend to do better at the intersection of cost and inventory. Those that do better on sales and operations effectiveness, if they rate themselves there, will do better on the intersection of growth and margin. And uh, we continue to look for the correlations, but it's hard work. So I have a question about uh, how did I select these particular metrics? And the metrics that we use in the supply chains to admire were really based upon the correlation that we did with Arizona State University against market capitalization. We wanted to look for what combination of metrics had the highest correlation to market cap. So thank you very much for joining us today. If there are any questions, just send me an email. And again, our contact information is here. I will be publishing on uh, the supply chains to admire analysis and a report at the end of the month. And if you or your organization have any questions, just reach out. Thank you.